Joey, thank you for uh, for joining Movie Junk today. It's a tremendous honor to uh, to have you on. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And before we kind of get things kick started, uh, how are things going so far in the new year? Any New Year's resolutions that you mind uh, sharing with us? Or, um, I mean, we're in lockdown in London, as you know, many people are around the world. So it's kind of a bit of a downer to start the year in yet another lockdown. But look, this is the. <laughs> It's an interesting one. I appreciate the mental health impact that sustained lockdowns have, but things could always be worse, right? You have to look at what the other side of the coin is. Things could always be worse and there's time, you know, there's time to be creative and do ventures in terms of New Year's resolutions. Just writing more, just before this, this uh, interview chat started, we were riffing a bit about writing and I think in the past, uh, I've written specifically for projects like the Street Fighter projects I've worked on and then had degrees of downtime. Now I have a slate of maybe about eight projects that I'm continuously writing on. Once you finish the treatment for one, straight on to the next. And I think writing has to become a habitual daily exercise. It's very easy when you write your first one or two scripts to feel like you've just some climbed Everest. I've done it, I deserve a year's break now. I don't need to do any more writing because what I just did was such an undertaking. But I think writers write and you wanna have any number of projects uh, maybe aimed at different budget levels and different genres at different levels of um, uh, complexity um or oh, levels of completion on the go so that's my resolution is that no matter what i'm acting in what i'm filming there's always new work being developed constantly and that's it requires a lot of discipline i mean you you said you write yourself so writing's just one of those odd phenomenons you've got it up there but sometimes your brain wants to do anything but write yeah you know absolutely yeah, and sometimes, yeah, you, you look for excuses to not write, you know what I mean? Because you're nervous as far as what is going to make it on the page. Sometimes what you have up here doesn't quite convey. Um, and then you, you, find, you find ways to, to make it happen. And then it's just the, the final product. It's, it's rewarding to kind of see it all kind of come to fruition. Because sometimes an idea might come from a dream. You might see something in the street. You might hear a song and then a picture plays in your head and then that turns into a whole uh, story as well. I, I yeah. definitely want to pick your brain a little bit around kind of the, the mythology behind kind of what you do to kind of prep versus because you, you mentioned, you know, you, you have a handful of treatments that you're working on and just completed one. Um, yeah. But the, the kind of want to just take a step back and just want to hear a little bit more around the journey, kind of how it all started. And, you know, the fan of me, you know, noticing that one of your first pictures was working on Batman Begins, but I want to know kind of what got you into acting. You're an acclaimed martial artist. I'm a huge fan of the martial artist genre. You're an actor, writer, director. Um, you also do your own stunts. So kind of how did you get started in the business? It sounds a bit ridiculous when you hear it it's read back to you, uh, doesn't it? Um, it's how did I begin? So I guess it starts with influences. I think I was very impressioned as a young kid by movies. Um, I often analyze the phenomena of the following, right? Let's say you, you, you pick 10 nine-year-olds and you sit them down and have them watch Rocky, Rocky one and Rocky two, right? All of those nine kids are going to get them feels, right? Hairs on the back of their neck up. They're going to feel energized and inspired for the duration of those films and maybe a day or so afterwards. But probably only two out of those nine kids are going to go on that they're permanently touched by that film. And that motivation and inspiration stays in them like a, a star. Um, whereas the other seven kids just get distracted by something else and something else. And I was one of those kids 
that would watch a film, but it would stay with me for years and years and years and years and years. And, years, and I, I would, it would change my life, right? Certain films like the Rocky films changed. Me. And I think that's a very powerful tool that a piece of entertainment can literally change the direction of a young mind's trajectory. Um, and then you want to do that yourself. When you felt that effect on you, you think, God, imagine if I could be in a position one day where I could make a kid or, or an adult who's watching something I'm in or I've written or I've directed all, all together and it inspires them. So I acted, I did a bunch of theater as a kid. I grew up in London till I was nine. And then my family moved to Ghana in West Africa. So I was there for five years at an international school, which was an amazing culture shock. I mean, my dad is Ghanaian, my mum's English, um, but moving to Ghana, you can imagine it's it's uh, it was a big culture shock, you know. And and I'm mixed race, so it's an interesting sort of um, ex unique experience. Growing up in London, I had largely a white experience. Most of my peer group and friends were white. Most of my role models were white. Other than my father and a handful of other people, I didn't have that many influences. And it's odd that people notice what's different than what's the same. I didn't have an issue in London, but it's interesting. People are, oh, you've got curly hair or, oh, you're, you know, your brown skin. But then when I moved to Ghana, it's the reverse effect. Ghanaians see me as a white guy. And it's, re it's a real, it's a real um, funny thing, but I think it's important to live in both worlds and understand and um, embrace both sides of my heritage uh, gave me, I guess, a lot of confidence in who I am to just be me and not then be defined by pigeonholed by race, ethnicity or colour. You're just an individual that has a foot in multiple worlds, right? Um, martial arts started in earnest for me in Ghana. I dabbled a bit in London beforehand, but I was so young, it wasn't anything serious. In Ghana, Taekwondo took over my life and um, motorbikes, I guess the stunt elements, like starting to learn to do flips and getting into riding motorbikes and stuff. And then I moved back to England at the age of 14 and uh, just intensified that training. I then started training ninjutsu, the whole acrobatic side really leveled up. So towards the end of high school, 17, uh, maybe 17, I was like, maybe it's not such a crazy idea getting into movies, you know? It's not so outlandish. Before you say that, people are like, pa, yeah. you, you know, because unless you know someone who works in the film business or you live in LA or you live somewhere where there's a lot of filming and it's around you, it feels like something that's happening on Mars, you know, it's not yeah. something you can really relate to and it's not believable. Um, so that's when it's like Neo, as, as Morpheus says, he's beginning to believe. Yeah. It was around that 16, 17 mark that I thought, yeah. So then you fast forward, I go to university to do a human biology degree and I'm starting to meet stunt guys, people who are doing booking commercials and doing sports modeling and, and I, I'm signing up to agencies and then Batman begins. When I, I was 19 and still at university, I got the chance to sort of be a, a stunt guy on Batman Begins. And you can imagine that's like a mind blowing um, experience and learning resource, you know? Um, little tidbits of that. Yeah, it's cool to be a ninja. For those of you that don't know, I was one of the League of Shadows ninjas up in the, uh, or ninja, plural, up in the mountains, the Himalayas, where Bruce Wayne goes to train. And um, it was fun training all the martial arts stuff and eventually going into the set for the first time. Um, with snow falling, you know, it's amazing what they can create in a soundstage that feels like you're outdoors, even though you're indoors, you know? And uh, things that stick in my mind is watching 
Christian Bale's process. Very serious guy, all about the work. He wasn't someone that would be chatting and joking between takes and just having a jolly. Super intense and kind of just invested in his internal monologue between takes, or he would go off and work out. Bale was working out nonstop. Um, and watching Nolan work, he has his monitor round his neck. You know, he has like a portable and no other monitors. You know, Nolan's famous for not having monitors. He's the only person that sees playback. He doesn't want to hear other people influencing him. And someone like Wally Pfister, uh, Nolan's longtime uh, DOP collaborator, it was he was really sweet. I remember him and Emma Thomas, Chris Nolan's wife, as look, I was essentially like a action extra. So I was very low on the totem pole, but I would ask Emma Thomas questions about production and design, and she would give me the time of day and explain things. And Wally Pfister, I remember he, he had set up a gel, like a, for those of you who don't know, like gels are translucent colored pieces of plastic that they put in front of lights, right? Movie lights to give a certain color. And shining through one of the windows of the, of the ninja temple was this light with this very conspicuous piece of orange plastic in front of it. And I said to the DP, won't, I can see that clearly there's some plastic in front of a light outside that window. I was like, aren't you gonna see that on camera? He was like, no, 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 come and, come and look through the, you know, the viewfinder. Because of the lens we're using, it's a long lens, the background's gonna be soft and that orange thing's gonna give a really nice diffuse sunset kind of warm glow through the window. And I was like, wow, so just, your brain's like a sponge at that time and it, it makes all the difference. Someone who's an expert pulling you aside and explaining how one little piece of the filmmaking process works and suddenly your brain, what you think is filmmaking just expands and expands and expands. So. Yeah, that's just a phenomenal crash course. I mean, your first picture, because uh, this was, I think your first picture, correct? that you worked on yeah because i was still at i had started doing extras work and stuff but this was the first studio u.s studio blockbuster size production um yeah because i mean you know you know working with nolan christian bale i mean this is you know in this major franchise you know it's because this was kind of the uh the reboot so to speak to the batman series and kind of bringing it back um, I mean, this was kind of like a baptism under fire, so to speak, you know, for you to kind of get in, work with the best. And, um, and, and even though, you know, Nolan, um, you know, he was still, you know, he had a reputation at that point. And I, I love the movie Memento. Yeah, that he did. Um, but this really kind of trajected him into a top tier uh, director at this point um, with, with this franchise. And it's just in with Batman, specifically the franchise, it kind of had reached. Uh, a hurdle, you know, because you had the first two Batmans, uh, you know, with Michael Keaton, but then the Val Kilmer one, um, you know, and then the, the Batman movies that followed after that kind of didn't reach that same mark as the first two Batman movies. So there was a lot of pressure into having this one succeed. And when Warner Brothers is also under a lot of pressure to kind of get this movie, uh, you know, in, in a new trajectory. And, um, I'm, th and I'm also noticing your uh, your T-shirt. You got the the Arnold's on there from Predator, Conan, Terminator, um, and you know Arnold was in also in a Batman movie as well too. Um, but just what an what an amazing experience to kind of you know have this be one of your early pictures and also be part of the uh, the League of Shadows as well too was just phenomenal. Yeah, it was it was amazing to watch. I mean, to reiterate you're very low down on the totem pole. You know, you don't really have agency. And it was more elaborate. We trained some cool like flips. I remember for the audition for the League of Shadows, they wanted to see whether you could do a butterfly twist, which is, um, it's a wushu move and in gymnastics, it's when you see people horizontally twist through the air, Darth Maul does it in Star Wars, 
episode one. Do you remember he does that cool yeah. thing and lands? That's that's in tricking world, martial arts world, that's called a butterfly twist. They wanted to see in the audition whether you could do a butterfly twist and whether you could do a kick the moon or a, a, a gain a somersault, where you sit, you essentially run and kick and do a somersault and land on the same leg that you've kicked. Um, and then there was a sword form that you, you had to learn because they had a sequence planned where with, with all the ninja sort of in rank and file moving into different formations like forward run forward and do the somersault land with the sword and then others would close it was really cool but we practiced all this stuff in a big empty sound stage and then when we actually got onto the set there must have been about 50 of us ninja all training together and then the first time we were brought onto the set it was much smaller than anyone had expected and there was maybe only room for about 30 35 ninja in that room so there are about 15 poor guys that didn't never got to go on camera because there just wasn't the room then you have added problems as liam neeson is obviously in that sequence towards the end of uh bruce wayne's training up there remember he has to inhale that blue flower that almost makes him start tripping a bit and all the ninja are changing formation and Liam Neeson keeps hiding in amongst them and then attacking Bruce Wayne and then vanishing back into the various rank and file. Um, and uh, because Liam Neeson's so tall, I think people don't realize how bloody tall he is. They yeah, then, really yeah, they then had to suddenly at the last minute get in extras who were like six five. So they would all, he would blend in. Otherwise, Liam Neeson trying to suddenly hide amongst the rank. He's like a beanpole standing up uh, in front of everyone else. But yeah, just just very cool to see Neeson and see. And look, the, the kind of eureka moment for me, we had been working on it for weeks. And not as the ninja, not doing that much. A lot of it is just standing there whilst Liam Neeson and Christian Bale walk and talk. And, and you know, do their, the focus is on them, not us. We almost might as well be set decoration, right? Um, the scene where Christian Bale is meant to be a, a, about to become a full member of the League of Shadow and his final kind of test is to execute that prisoner that they bring forward. Yeah. And, and, and Bale's like, I'm no executioner. Do you, do you remember that line? And, um, I remember watching that scene and um, hairs on the back of my neck standing up. And I was like, wow, that buzz, this scene is so tense, the drama's so tense and the voices, Liam Neeson's voice and Bale's voice. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm feeling all magical here. And I was like, that's what I wanna do. Out of the weeks we've been here, this is the most exciting thing I've experienced, more than the action. It's that. And I suddenly like, that's what I want to do. I still want to do the action and be able to do my own action, but I want to act. I now suddenly felt if I just do the action without that acting, it will be a hollow experience for me. Yeah. So from that point on, I was like, I don't want to be a stuntman per se, a professional stuntman that just doubles other actors or does... Um, utility stunts i want to be you know an actor who can do his own actions should the role require it but um yeah and that's you can imagine that's when things really kicked off and then the born ultimatum ended up we fast forward i've got an agent i'm now acting i'm auditioning you know i'm in the system and then the the dash role in born ultimatum comes up and that was the chance to play a major character in a major movie um, and do all my own action and not be doubled. And, and it was like, wow, you know, and it happened pretty early on in my career because I think I graduated university when I was 21 and then I got the Bourne role at 23. Yeah. So yeah, it was quite quick. Do, do you mind kind of walking us through kind of what that audition process was like, how you landed the role 
and then once you got on kind of what what that experience was uh you know being on uh, such a such a huge and it's a franchise that's still going on uh, today as well so do you mind just kind of walking us through kind of what that audition no was like? i mean as long as i'm not boring anyone i feel like i've oh, told no. this story many a time but i'll happily you know i i appreciate there may be people that haven't heard the story so um i a footnote to this story that I'm about to tell is the fact that when I graduated uni, straight out of uni, I managed to land a role, a lead support role in an indie film. And whilst we were filmed, that was a very special experience. I'm, I'm actually like acting, you know, a character with an arc and dialogue and stuff, making every mistake an actor, a young actor can make under the sun in it. But one night after filming, the director, the lead of the film and myself went to the cinema to see The Bourne Supremacy had just come out. I loved the first one. We watched Supremacy and I was like, wow, like these films have a really powerful, strong impact on me. So you can imagine then getting a call a year or two later saying, Joey, there's an audition. You've, you've got a request casting for the newborn movie for this new kind of agent, like more advanced than born or whatever. You're almost like, this is insane. Like, it feels like I just watched the second one and, and you're telling me there's an opportunity that I can be in that world. I may be able to step into that universe that I've enjoyed watching. So what a request casting is, is where the casting director already knows you from previous auditions he's had you in for and specifically seeks you out to come and audition for the role as opposed to uh, the alternative situation is a casting director sends out a brief, a casting brief for a particular character he's trying to cast. He may go for some specific actors, request cast some specific actors he knows, but the rest of the actors that audition are just suggested agents put up actors on their books that they think fit that brief. And then the casting director's like, I'll see this guy, I'll see this guy, not him, I'll see him, not him. So when you get request cast, it's very special because it means you're already kind of on a short list for the director. So for the casting director. So the first audition was actually at Pinewood Studios and it was a physical, a physical audition. Um, they wanted to see whether you could ride a motorbike and or scooter with gears, manual, whether you had that experience, and fight. It was like fight choreography for two hours. Um, I later found out that they had already cast someone for Desh. Um, and their plan was a month's training in LA with 8711. This guy um, supposedly was just partying in LA and, and a heavy smoker and his stamina wasn't good. He was turning up for training each day, just a, a state, you know? And after two weeks, the fight choreographer, Jeff Imada, I think called the producer and, was, uh, the producers and said, this isn't gonna work with this dude. Wow. He's, he's, he's not taking it seriously. He's not gonna be able to make the grade for what you want out of this character. So they fired the guy. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? So now <clears throat> they have to emergency recast to this part. And there's only two weeks of rehearsal left because the guys wasted the first two, right? So they need someone that's kind of box ready, you can imagine. They need someone who is already a fairly accomplished martial artist and can learn choreography. Um, ride a motorbike and can act, but they're like, if you can't do the physical stuff, we're not even going to look at your acting. So the acting component was the second audition. So the first audition, there's like 60 dudes. Um, can you ride a motorbike? All the fight stuff. And then I get a call to say it's down to like three of you, three or four of you. And then it was an acting audition with the casting director. Um, the scene we had to do was actually 
something that, that ended up not being in the script down the line. Remember in the Bourne legacy with Jeremy Renner, do you remember that the various agents are sort of hooked on these pills that yeah. Treadstone give them? It's almost to stop them going rogue. They need to take these pills or they'll get strong withdrawal symptoms. So that is actually an artifact from the original Ultimatum script that they removed from Ultimatum and then used later. Um, they referenced the pills. Do you remember in, in the first one? Um, with Clive Owen, mm -hmm. because he remember is taking the pills. And remember he says, as he's bleeding out, having been shotgunned by Bourne, he's like, do you get the headaches? Yeah. yeah. Do you remember, he's like, do you get the headaches? Like, so they hint already that the Treadstone guys are on some kind of meds, but maybe not super strong. So with Blackbriar, they thought we're gonna put them on a shorter leash with some stronger drug withdrawal. So it, so to cut a long story short, in the original script, me and Bourne are fighting in the apartment and I'm getting the better of him and it's not looking good for Bourne. But then I start going into withdrawal and Bourne notices something's up. I'm sort of breaking out in a cold sweat and sort of starting to twitch a bit. And, and then I'm looking for my bag, trying to get to my bag to get these pills out. So Bourne is then kicking the bag away and, and that was a whole thing. And then eventually I go into withdrawal, like sort of catatonic shock or whatever. And he's like, you know, call it in, call it in, you know, that I'm dead, whatever. So that was what I did in, in that audition, I remember that kind of scene going into shock. They really wanted to see whether you could go, you know, 100% and, and do something very visceral. I do that one, I wait, I get a call, Joey, it's down to you and one other guy. You couldn't be more different from one another. Um, Paul Greengrass wants to meet you at his house. <laughs> We're gonna send a car for you take you to Greengrass's place and uh yeah he's he'll make his decision so I was like amazing number one but number two I, I said to the casting director are they gonna if Greengrass is gonna see me and this other guy at the same time isn't that gonna be a bit awkward because we're kind of gonna be bidding for this role of a lifetime yeah at the same time and that could all get a bit desperate and like dick measuring and 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 he was like, that's a good point. He's like, well, look, Paul's a very smart guy. So if he, if he has asked to see you at the same time, it's for a, a good reason. There's a reason behind it. So I was like, you've got to like run a bit of strategy. I was kind of like, if, I, if, if Paul is seeing us staggered, then, um, and I just have him to myself, I'll just be myself and, and hopefully convince him why I'm the best man for the job. If the other guy is there, I'm going to gamble on not being drawn into a bidding war. If this guy's up selling himself and talking, I'm just going to leave him to it with yeah. Paul. I'm going to try and channel the character that I'm hopefully going to play. These guys don't lose their cool under pressure. They don't, you know, yeah. they don't allow themselves to be compromised. So I'm just going to be silent and be there. And if Paul wants to ask me something, I'll, I'll answer him, you know, with dynamite, hopefully. But otherwise, I'm going to be a man of few words. I turn up there and the other actor's already there, you know, with Greengrass walking down his driveway, having a chat. And I'm like, oh, God. So here we go. head start on you. Yeah, I'm like, here we go. So I try to dress for the part subtly, just give the part and you know we went into Paul's kitchen and he was oh, I'll make you a cup of tea and stuff and then I remember Paul's daughter came home and his dog was in the room I was just chatting to his daughter and playing with the family dog and I think his wife possibly was there I was literally almost just I'll leave them to chat you know I'm not going to interrupt and try and butt in or just be standing there like an awkward third wheel I'm like Fuck that, you know. So, um, so yeah, that's how you know. Eventually, obviously, Paul spoke to me and we talked, and the rest is history, right? Yeah. Um, so then we're filming, and so I, I go to LA for two weeks to train with um, 
8711, who are one of the leading action design um, companies in Hollywood. Um, for those of you that don't know, it was originally founded by Chad Stahelski, um, who directs the John Wick movies, uh, David Leach, who directed Deadpool 2 and Hobson Shaw and, you know, they're big guys, and Damon Caro. Damon Caro did like the, he works with Zack Snyder a lot. So 300 was Damon Caro, Watchmen, you know, all of those kind of things. So it was those three guys originally set that company up. They were all stunt guys in America who got together, I guess, invested their money together and set up a full-time facility to train actors, pre action sequences. And they've got some of the best talent like stunt and particularly fight talent out there and they're, they're super successful they're now all main unit directors on big hollywood productions so it was pretty cool going to train there and uh, jeff imada who he did the crow and um even big trouble in little china one of my favorite Love it. 80s films he's he's in it you know Remember Jack Burton in the airport when the Lords of Death punks, mm -hmm. the guy that's spinning all the, the sort of extendable baton and knife and like Jack Burton's moving back on his ass on the floor. That's Jeff Amada. And uh, Blade, the first Blade film, that was Jeff doing the choreography. He's in it. So um, amazing stuff. Yeah, he, he trained Brandon Lee for a while, like. Jeff is like a real legend with great lineage. So you can imagine it's like, oh my God, this dude, you know, I'm, I'm getting to um, train under him and stuff. Did you, did you have any, uh, or, or who were your favorite martial artists kind of growing up? I mean, we just touched on Brandon Lee. Um, did you grow up kind of watching Bruce Lee or any of the, the legends? Completely, completely. Or by that point, I mean, I was, I'm telling you, I was obsessed with martial arts, I lived, I lived martial arts and um, and tricking, doing crazy acrobatic stuff, you know, like, you know, video game type stuff. I really dedicated myself. So Bruce Lee, Jackie Chan, Van Damme, yeah. Dolph Lundgren, Yun Biao, all the Hong Kong things, Chu Man Chuck, Donnie Yen, um, you name it. You, you name it, I was, I was into it, you know? I mean, I remember I got, for my sixth or seventh birthday, I got Dragons Forever on VHS from my cousin. Jackie Chan, Samo Hung, Yung Biao, Benny the Jet is in there. Still today, probably one of my, my favorite Jackie film. Yeah. So you can imagine the influences were very, very strong. So I knew who was who in the, in the, in the sort of action world. You know. So you, you mentioned, uh, you know, one of your favorites uh, and one of the names, Van Damme. And I'm, I'm going to ask you to kind of wear your, uh, you know, your Joey fan hat. You know, what's, what's your favorite uh, Van Damme movie? Yeah. Um, Kickboxer holds a very special place in my heart. Kickboxer is a better movie than Bloodsport. Bloodsport is still amazing for a number of reasons, but Kickboxer, I think, is a superior composed movie. Amazing. If you just, yeah. Um, Kung Fu. And yeah, I mean, there's so many things to love. The music in Kickboxer is just, you get goosebumps when you hear it now, the training um, music and... Um, the locate the sort of jungle location of it um, was called what's so nice you know and you recognize this being an actor those two films I know he had done Black Eagle with Sho Kasugi and and No Retreat No Surrender little parts but Bloodsport and Kickbox were the first starring vehicles for Van Damme and when you see an actor who is hungry Van Damme was hungry so he was putting his all into those films. He left it all on the on celluloid. And you often get 
some of the best work of an actor when they're hungry before they're a bona fide star. They're not wealthy, they're not comfortable. This whole dream can be snatched away from them in an instant. And you can see almost this vulnerability and this desperation. And it's a very interesting concept of, when you think of the archetypal movie star, that has specific traits and isms that you think that's their signature style, the performance style that makes them them. It takes these actors two, three, maybe four films to find out what that magic is. Then it's a problem because they then become a prisoner of their own construct. They're like, oh, the fans liked it when I did this. The fans really responded when I said that. So now I'm gonna, I'm almost scared now to be uh, sailing without a map. Yeah. Now I have these set waypoints that I almost have to hit. You can see it with Arnold. When he said, I'll be back in Terminator, shit, people love it when I say a one-liner. Yeah. I'm going to now be a one-liners guy. And, and you see how these things become crystallized. And sometimes these actors cannot escape them then. And Van Damme, um, you can see the birth of where his signature style is, but there's still a vulnerability and a rawness and a lack of a sense of self. You're not self-aware of this is who, I, this is what my screen persona is. So as a result, I think they're more endearing, uh, those performances. Why, why do you think as fans were, were so drawn to this martial arts kind of, you know, genre? I mean, I think it, it really took off and, you know, it started kind of late 60s and then 70s was just huge, you know, with martial arts and kung fu. And I mean, still to this day, I mean, it's one of the most popular um, you know, categories or genres in a movie. Why do you think we're so drawn to, do fans just enjoy seeing, you know, guys get their ass kicked or why do you think we're so drawn to these uh, martial arts stars? I think it's, it's, it's like watching ballet. It's, it's aspirational to see one man taking on many people. Yeah. So on a very basic level, we all want to be tough. We all want to be able to defend ourselves and to defeat the bad guy, um, defeat the bully. So you are ch channeling the, these, these martial arts on screen stars represent something you want. Well, that's a very interesting thing. What do people want in life? What does the average human being out there desire that they don't have? you can put that, if you can embody that in a leading character on screen, you're gonna have captivated audience because it's like a drug, isn't it? It's why do people take drugs? Because it makes you feel good. Probab and the people that are more drawn to taking drugs are people that don't feel that good without the drug. Someone that is innately very happy and very content, you'll probably find doesn't have that many vices in life because they get everything they need for their dopamine and serotonin release. Um, your sort of neurotransmitter reward scheme is kind of self-produced. But when, you're, when you don't have that, you seek external sources for that. And I think certain performers become like a drug because they just represent, they make you feel and, and, and make, they represent something very enticing, very sexy, very uh, attractive. And you feel that some of that's gonna rub off on you if you indulge in this thing for long enough, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, it just, it's, it's, it's one of those, you know, we, and, and I think you, you, you touched on it perfectly. I think there's a little bit of all of us where we wanna be able to take on, you know, multiple people and, you know, be able to do it, you know, like watching, you know, the Karate Kid, you know, you, you see all these moves that they're doing and you're like, man, I can, I can do that too. I want to do the crane kick. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's kind of that, uh, that inner voice inside of us that, you know, tells us I can. There's yeah. moves that you're seeing now that, you know, we just, we never saw back in the seventies and the eighties. Guys are in better shape. They're doing more acrobatics versus just doing a straight kick. There's flips that, you know what I mean? And uh, yeah. And things go in cycles, things come around. I mean, I think each, it's really interesting to look at different martial arts styles and think, what was their USP? What was, what, 
What was the new thing they brought to the table? Um, you, let's start the timeline. Shaw Brothers, 60s, 70s martial arts films. Shot wide, you got to think like peaking opera is where the basis of all the performers came from doing these Shaw Brothers productions. So it was very circus-esque. And they would shoot it like a play, that very wide uh, profile. You didn't have that many down the line, over the shoulder type angles. It was very much two people fighting like this rather than, you know, rotational axes of shooting. Long sequences. The problem when you watch those films, it feels like they're very skilled performers, but no one has that much power because it takes about 50 moves thrown before you vanquished your opponent. Bruce Lee enters the scene and one hit and the person's gone. And you're saying like, geez, this guy's a powerhouse. Yeah. He's, he's ripped, he's topless, he's sweating. He looks like a kind of jungle cat. You know, he, Bruce Lee brought a kind of presence and intensity. Um, something that was alive that, that you couldn't sort of bottle, you know, Bruce Lee kind of his charisma. You look at the Shaw Brothers type films, there's very little charisma. The, the performance style is very dry and a bit drone-like. Whereas Bruce Lee was, it was an individual that broke boundaries. Whether you're white, black, you know, Asian, Bruce Lee was a sex symbol. He was the first Asian sex symbol. Everyone wanted to be, be Bruce Lee, walk like him, even the way he would chew his swag. You think Bruce Lee like was swagging out long before that was a thing, you know? Um, so Bruce Lee brought that. Jackie Chan came along and brought Kung Fu comedy in, you know? A guy that seemed vulnerable rather than um, Jackie Chan appearing invincible like Bruce Lee often would he would get hurt, you know, accidentally, you know, punch someone, it would hurt. And mixed in with the acrobatic style, he had his thing. As Van Damme said, you know, he was the first person. I am the first to make martial arts sexy, you know? Um, and that's what he did. With his ballet background, beautiful lines and form, toes pointed, very nice lines, great physique, pretty boy face. Van Damme, you just loved watching his body in motion. He was just a beautiful thing to look. And that's a really interesting thing. He made martial arts sexy. Yeah, um, yeah. Particularly to a West, because it's packaged in a Caucasian man, he's really tapping into Western and at the time, 80s standards of beauty and sex appeal. He really cornered that um, very well. So, um, it, and it goes on and on and on. But yeah, it's really interesting to think what, what made this person stand out. Yeah, and another uh, martial artist that I wanted to mention, and uh, just this kind of reminded me when, when you mentioned uh, Deadpool, um, this guy, you can, in a sense, you can call him the original Deadpool because he was the one doing all the stunts in, um, in Wolverine, the original Wolverine, uh, Scott Atkins. Uh, and you guys, you guys did, uh, I think it was the Green Street uh, series, never, it was the third, never back down, yeah, right. that one. And I love Scott Atkins. I, I was so happy to see him and Van Damme kind of team up in the Expendables. Thought that yeah. was a perfect, perfect matchup because, you know, for us, you know, we're, we're used to, you know, seeing these guys as good guys and then kind of seeing them, you know, both be the villains, villain. Um, what was it like working with uh, Scott Atkins? Scott has been a good friend of mine for 15 years. And um, he has his own show that I was on recently yeah. called The Art of Action, um, which is worth any Scott Atkins fans out there. Go check that episode out with. I love Logan. watching it. I saw it too. Yeah. yeah, very good show. So Scott is someone who is just a powerhouse. Man, I mean, he he really lit a fire under my ass because I was training, particularly when Undisputed 2 came out, 
it was just like, oh my God, this guy is just on another level. Not just the moves, the ba his basic skills, his boxing, his, his basic kicks, his tricking kicks and flips, but his physique, you're just like, this guy's the total package and he's an absolute, his intensity, his screen presence and sort of intimidation factor on screen is just, so at the time it's like, well, this guy is now my biggest rival. This guy has just set a bar as, as a contemporary new school action actor. And I'm just like, thank goodness you know, we became friends. We can't beat them, join them, you know, as, as they say. And, um, and yeah, we, I remember he started coming to train at the gymnastics place. So like a lot of us in the action industry go to adult gymnastics classes. There'll be proper gymnastics gymnasiums that in the evenings have like two hour slots for adult, either ex gymnasts who are now adults to come and train. You get break dancers, stunt guys, whatever come and there's often a set class and then the ability to do your own thing. Use the tumble track, the foam pit, the sprung floor. Um, so in any given city, there's going to be a number of key adult gymnastics places where anyone kind of in the industry goes. So once in a while, you're going to see some big action movie guy come in and you're like, oh, it's so-and-so, you know? And I remember the first time Scott came to Hendon Gymnastics and everyone, there was this big buzz and everyone, and I just started getting into acting. I'd done Batman Begins. I'd done an episode of a big TV show here in the UK. And I was like, oh my God, it's Scott. And I'm like, I want to work with this guy. I want to be this guy's peer. So I don't want to meet him as a fanboy, although I am a fan. <laughs> A huge fan of his work. I don't want that for because first meetings count for a lot. It's the same thing on Batman Begins. A load of my fellow ninjas were going up and sort of trying to talk to Christian Bale just for the sake of saying, Yeah, I spoke to Christian Bale, when they were probably distracting him from his focus. I just thought, I'm not even going to speak to this guy. I'm not going to go near. I'm not going to because. I want to meet Christian Bale one day as a peer, as actor and actor on a film, not as like stunt extra and star. Do you see what I mean? Because then that cements this kind of huge uh, chasm. So with Scott, I was like, look, I'm just going to do my training, do my own thing. Hopefully a scenario will come where we just organically speak not because i've gone over to sort of kiss the ring you know and that's what happened i think there was a certain move i was a cap because i did capoeira for years he was like i want to learn some of that stuff because there was a film scott was going to do with isaac florentine called capoeira and i think that was one of the first times he came over and was like can you show me that again then we introduced each other and spoke and Eventually, after like our third, fourth meeting, I said, oh, by the way, Scott, um, I'm an actor as well. He's like, oh, really? What have you done? I told him a bit and, and I said that Look, I'm a fan of your work, man. You're super in impressive. And then we exchanged numbers and I remember he invited me to his 30th birthday. Um, and then not that long after, I got born. Yeah. So when I landed born and got the desh roll, I remember I called Scott and I was like, you're not going to believe it. I've just landed, you know, role of a life. I said, but there's another Blackbriar agent. Paz, call your agent, try and get, get in this um, gig. That obviously went to Edgar Ramirez, but Scott did get a role as one of the CIA agents in the Madrid part of the film. So he did, he, you know, he did get on there and, that was cool and we've been close ever since. So Green Street was an opportunity. That film was super low budget and super ambitious, right? Cause it's these kind of five on five fights. I think every fight there's 10 people fighting and there's about 12 of those fights and then various other fights. So I came on board to act in it as one of the support leads. And then I did all the action. 
I choreographed all the fights and uh, got most of the guys in, most of the, the hordes of people you see fighting in that film. I got them in to work for, you know, little or nothing, you know, for the experience. There's only so many times you can use a favor like that. But for a lot of people, that was their route into the industry. There are some people who are working quite a lot in the sort of action movie side as actors or stunt guys. And that was their first gig that I got them, you know? So I think when you're starting out doing the odd project for free, there's no, there's no shame in that. I think we all do it. You just need the experience and to make the contacts and stuff. But it was cool to be acting with Scott, working with Scott and, um, doing action, but it was a stressful shoot because it was short, very little prep, very little money, but you know. Do you think we'll uh, we'll see you guys uh, together soon? Any other I would, projects? I keep saying to Scott, I mean, we always keep other each other abreast of projects we're doing or opportunities and stuff. That's cool. We very much are sort of supportive of each other's careers. And Scott has, like accident man he offered me a role in that but i was like scott i'm super flattered but when we work together next it has to be the right project i don't want to like spunk that opportunity away on a project that is not deserving of the two of us hopefully making magic on screen together so i'm kind of like scott let's hold out for a project with a budget, a decent budget, that's gonna get the right showcase, you know? Because yeah. doing a straight to DVD or one of these DTV things, let's wait till there's a Netflix original yeah. that one of us is doing that we can bring the other in on that's gonna have a massive audience, good focus, and the budget and the time to do a, like a legacy project. If I work with Scott, I don't want it to be, oh, that was like a cheap film. It's a shame it wasn't that good. We've yeah. done Green Street. It was, I think, a big achievement for, you know, that film had a budget of 250K. Wow. Well, that's nothing. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. Um, when you think one episode of Westworld costs $10 million, yeah. it puts it into perspective, right? Um, so yeah, so, you know, I, I, I hope we do get to work together before we're too old and broken, you know, but yeah. And you, you also mentioned, I mean, you're, you're currently actively writing, um, you know, you're always staying busy. Um, are there any, uh, near term, uh, upcoming projects that you're able to kind of share with the fans today or anything that you're currently working on? I'm doing, um, a project that I'm actively uh, working on is uh, based on the Dutch resistance in World War II. It's a very, in my producer partner, Jackie Queller, um, who produced Street Fighter Assassin's Fist and Street Fighter Legacy and Street Fighter Resurrection that I directed um, and wrote. Her fam she's got Dutch heritage and her great aunt was in the resistance in World War II in, in, in Holland. And um, a very tragic, interesting story with, that involves a resistance member who turned, who was arrested by the SS and kind of interrogated and turned, who then sold out hundreds of, of Dutch resistance people and it's such a personal, true story uh, in the family of someone, you know, who's very dear to me. And it's so funny when she, she went to a big family reunion in Holland with all her extended family and she came back having learned this thing about her, you know, her sort of grandparents' generation, you know. So it would have been her granddad's sister potentially, or, sorry, I'm, I'm almost, my brain is fried from writing this, but you get the idea, it's, yeah. it's that, that generation. Yeah. Um, and she told me this thing, and initially I wrote it down, I wrote like a, maybe a one page or two page a thing, and parked it. It's funny how projects, stars align. 
So I put that, developed it to a certain point and did research around it and had all these notes compiled and stuff. And then I parked it and was working on other stuff. I then did a short film in Holland with a Dutch director that I action directed and choreographed called Siebler. And I really hit it off with him. And I thought, this is a director I want to work with. Because although I direct myself, it's a lot to take on to write, direct and act all at the same time. There are certain projects where I may like to write, produce and act in, star in, but then have someone else whose vision and technical ability I really respect, who we have a great shorthand and shared artistic vision to direct. So I thought this is a guy I want to nurture a relationship with. Fast forward a bit of time, he does his first theatrical movie um, in Holland that Pathé co-financed and distributed theatrically. And he had the Dutch film board kind of come to him and say, so what are you, you, know, what are, what are you doing next? If you've got a treatment for something, there's, fi- you know, the, we could unlock financing to finance this treatment to a screenplay. And then if there's a good screenplay, we could part finance the movie. And so instantly, suddenly, this Dutch project that I had gathering dust for a little bit moved to the top of the pile. Wow. I was like, okay, let's get this. So then I was like, Danny, I think you'll be great. Danny's the Dutch director. It'd be great if you direct this. I would like to write it and be a producer on it. And of course, my producer partner, Jackie, whose family story this is, will produce it. So we got together and started toying with ideas and went through a few early uh, treatment ideas. Um, And then it's like, okay, I'm gonna write. So, and then, yeah, now there we have a 35 page, almost 14,000 word um, treatment done. So, that's why um, you, I think as a writer you need a, or a producer, you need a slate of projects because you never know when suddenly one is flavor of the month. Things change in the world and suddenly this project is more relevant than ever. And that may have been in fourth position of priority and suddenly it jumps to the top. And that's kind of what happened with this. I was actually in earnest writing a project called The Last Brushstroke, that is maybe two thirds complete. And I was super into it and I had to pause that and then jump onto this this World War II Dutch resistance thing. Um, So now that's off my plate for a bit. I'm gonna go back to the treatment I was working on and, and try and complete that. An interesting note on, I mean, all writers do have different processes, but I like to write Normally I start with an initial kind of 10 page outline. I'll pitch it to a couple of trusted readers, get feedback, bounce ideas. And then I'm like, okay, now I'm gonna write a proper treat. And for me, a treatment is becomes like this 40 page monster. It becomes, it's got the detail of a screenplay. If you were to read my treatment, there's full on dialogue in sections, key scenes where I think, the dialogue is coming fresh to me in my head. I'm going to get it down. So then when it comes to eventually writing your first draft screenplay, it's super quick. So for example, the, this treatment I've just written now, 35 pages, font 14 in words. So you, you can imagine how dense that is. I could turn that into a first draft screenplay in a week, I reckon, because it's everything is there, literally. The scenes how it transitions from scene to scene. Um, And it's almost a formatting exercise, just opening final draft and starting to transpose that across. And that's Street Fighter Assassin's Fist was written in the same way. I think I'd written like a 60 page, 70 page Bible before doing uh, the episode treatments and and it was very quick in terms of writing this and some of the dialogue you see in the the finished article of assassin's fist is exactly the same as it was in that original 
novel-esque bible do you know what i mean so i rather like to do the hard work in the treatment and then the screenplay is easy and then you can do a few redrafts rather than i think some people do a kind of outline a two to ten page outline and then they start doing the screenplay and they end up doing 10 15 drafts of the screenplay yeah do you see what i mean yes. like they're doing the work in the screenplay i'm like work it out as a novel then the screenplay is easy yeah but everyone's different i'm not saying my way is the right way it's just instinctively sometimes i'm like right i'm going to do a 10 page bullet point treatment and then it becomes this thing with the bullet points start getting bigger and bigger each bullet point until there's like two page bullet points i'm like i'm writing a novel at this point you the know problem with the bullet points is that you captured the magic on the bullet points and you already have the thoughts on the bullet points now you have to recreate it in the treatment it's like if you just did it on the treatment you can just finish you can have it you know there you know because now you're trying to try to remember that point and kind of live back in that point again and then have to recreate yeah. it again on the treatment versus if you have the treatment it's much easier to convert that to a screenplay exactly and why i think because this is the problem sometimes people are like structure 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 get your three act structure like people who like i read half of save the cat the famous screenwriting book and i just stopped i'm like i don't like these formulas where it's like by page 10 this has to happen inciting incident must happen by page 10 and it almost becomes like a connect the dots formula for making a movie i'm like right instinctively if you suddenly have a massive inspired info dump, get it down. You can always chop it down later, right? Editing is always easier than creating, right? Yeah. So I always feel if you feel creative and you feel like writing two, three pages of treatment for one scene, do have at it, do it. Because editing that down later is easy and fun. But as you said, if you underwrite in the bullet point or treatment, then you get to the screenplay and you're like, I have to put meat on these bones now. You're then sat there with writer's block thinking, I haven't thought this through. Now you're tying yourself in knots and, and you yeah. know what it's like. Yeah, like I, I, I kind of digress to folks like, uh, like John Carpenter. And again, I'm nowhere, I don't even want to put my name in the same sentence, but you know, for him, you know, he would just grab a six pack of beer and he'd pump out a script in a day. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, 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 that, and that's it. I don't even think they knew what structure was or any of that stuff. And, you know, Halloween was born, you know, so. Um, same thing with John Milius, right? Yep. Conan. And yep. he did the first Apocalypse Now. I think, didn't Milius do Apocalypse Now? I thought, I thought he was... Yeah, because he, I thought he wrote it, and uh, that that was him, I believe. Yes. Yeah, and he's like he. John Millis in an interview is like, I have never gone to a writing class. I've never read a book on writing. Yeah. I don't know about structure, seven act structure, three act. I just write. Yeah. <laughs> and you and it's then you get more unique films, isn't it? I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But every, people's minds work in, in different ways and you, you've got to write, you've got to find something that's productive for you, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever, you know, like sometimes I'm envious of these writers that have all their scene cards laid out as if their mind is an Excel flow chart and they mix it all around. I'm like, I, I don't do that. I just fucking write. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I can <laughs> definitely relate. Um... And yeah, and no, I, it's, you know, I, I got this book I and mean, this thing, I don't want to, I'm giving a little bit of a promo. This book is awesome. Uh, it was recommended to me um, by actually a, a fellow actor. And um, it's really helped me because it kind of, it's a, it's a hybrid between the structure and then kind of, you know, you writing with your own kind of creative flow um, because it, you, it is okay to kind of have a checks and balances um, at to some point, but that's really helped me uh, along with, uh, you know, just, you know, meeting individuals like you and, and getting, you know, good, good guidance. Um, it, it really, uh, you know, makes, you have to take everything and kind of collect it. And then hopefully it turns into this, you know, work of art, even if it's just in, in your head. 
I mean, the ideal, right? This is where money gives you freedom to increase your workflow. And I have some close actor friends that I'm encouraging to write more and more. And because look, you have to write a bunch of stuff and get stuff made and go through the editing process, go through the process of this script has been commissioned. Now these people are insisting on changes, cut this and this character and do this. You have to go through that heartbreaking process of parts of your baby being cut off mercilessly and get beyond that emotional thing. The first time you write something that gets made, it's a very emotional process and you'll almost start to become paranoid or turn on your own collaborative partners who are making logical suggestions for why the film needs less of this and more of this. Let's lose this scene altogether because it's not moving the story forward. And you're like, stop attacking my, my, you know, my, my creation. When you've gone through that and come out the other side, you're battle hardened. So in, as, as passionate as you are about a script, you are far more ready to have people cut into it and make criticisms. And you're like, cool, this is the process. I, you, you know, you factor that in. But the point I was making is I would love to just have a writer on payroll. I splurge out a treatment and I'm just like, convert this into a screenplay. I can't even be asked to go into final draft and you know do all that stuff. Here's the treatment, just turn it, I'm gonna write it long form and just turn it into a screenplay. Then once I've got my first draft screenplay, I'll then just start doing edits, which is so easy and fun. Yeah. And that process is amazing. Imagine you never had to write the first draft screenplay because you, you just wrote a feverish, as you said, six pack of beer or chain smoking spliffs or joints, you know, you get this thing done. And then someone is like, I'm going to give you a first draft and it's all your ownership. You're just, they're not going to get the writing credit. It's all you. They're almost just formatting it for you. And then it's like, cool. Now it's in final draft as a first draft. I can just keep polishing it. Yeah. What a fun process, right? Yeah, and, I, and I, I, I'm pretty sure that there are a lot of writers that do have their teams that kind of take their ideas and basically, you know, do the uh, kind of the labor, so to speak, you know, versus, you know, typing things. It kind of gives me uh, more respect for guys like Stallone, who, you know, still writes all of his scripts. So, you know, you see him, you know, pen and paper, writing all the dialogue, and then I'm sure he takes that and someone else types it in. But imagine writing, you know, 200, you know, two because you know, his movies are usually long. Imagine writing 200 pages all by freehand. Mm -hmm. And I was reading, because someone asked him, said, how many revisions does it usually take so you get to the final product? I think he said something like 300, 400 revisions before you get, say, a, you know, a Rambo or a Rocky or something like that. Um, but it's just insane, you know, with all these different styles and, uh, you know, folks are still free freehand writing these things. And um, I, Joey, I do want to be respectful of your time because I can pick your brain all just on screenwriting. And I think we should do a session just on <laughs> screenwriting on, on round yeah. two. Um, but I did wanna just close off with one last question because, uh, and again, this is just something that I wanted to ask early on, but I didn't wanna let you leave without asking it. You'd mentioned- Don't Rocky worry about the time. Yeah, keep going. You ask what you wanna ask. You mentioned Rocky one and Rocky two earlier on. I wanna mm. know which one's your favorite. I would have to say Rocky two. I think the way, for two reasons, the training montage in Rocky II, um, in terms of the fit, I love that it's double because you have the training montage, then you have the amazing sprinting with the crowd growing, growing and him. But the whole thing of Adrian in a coma and Rocky's not training and, you know, um, Mickey's great, you know, I don't rock, yeah, I don't want to raise my voice in the house of God, but you got a hell of a lot of talent, kid, a hell of a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, when she wakes up, she's like, come here, come here. I want you to do one thing for me. What's that? Win. And Mickey, 
what are we waiting for? Take this. And boom, you hear, doom, you hear the, the sort of oh, yeah. belt holding for the training montage. And you're just like, the feels that Rocky II gives you. And the sprinting. And the final, um, I find it even more heart-wrenching the very end of Rocky II than one when his face is completely pepperoni pizza at the end of two. I just want to say to my wife and kid at home, yo, Adrian, I did it. It just breaks you. It, it disassembles you into your elemental components, that film, when you watch it. So I think two just hits an emotional epiphany that's even greater than one. And one is Titanic in its, what it represents. It's, it's, it's hard because one is obviously is an amazing movie. It's just that, and in some ways two is standing on the foundation of one, which is what elevates two. Maybe one is a superior movie if you were to just take it as a standalone construction, but in terms of how films make you feel, I put so much stock in a film has to make me viscerally feel something. I need, to, if I was hooked up to um, a lie detector machine for uh, perspiration from fingertips and blood work measuring my hormone levels, I want a film that is off the charts. There's so many films I watch these days, including most action films, that I'm flatlining watching them. I'm absolutely flatlining. Whereas a film like Whiplash, Whiplash is in my top 10 films of all time because of how it makes you feel. I often tell people, you wanna see, you wanna know what I think is a good action movie? Whiplash is the best, one of the best ever action movies without being an action movie, without punches and kicks and guns being, you know, let off. Because it represents nemeses. Yeah. Student versus mentor, mentor versus student. It's deeply elemental and just two nemeses pitted against each other. It taps into something very, very elemental and primal and it's spellbinding. And I'm like, the way that film makes you feel is how action movies should make you feel. Yeah, yeah. But most of them don't, don't come close. I mean, look, I, I appreciate, for example, what the John Wick movies have done in terms of showing action and actors have trained their asses off and new things, but those films don't make me feel anything. Yeah. People are talking about, oh, the gunplay. I'm like, you want a gunfight? Go and watch Heat. Yeah. Go and watch the gun battle in Heat, then come back and tell me that the guns, the gunplay and gun stuff, because you don't feel any danger. Yeah. The irony is watching Keanu Reeves on the range at Taran Tactical's range, firing live rounds, it's, it's, it gives me more of a feeling than watching him in the film yeah. with an airsoft gun running around. When someone's firing real bullets, you, there's something, an atmosphere changes because there's a level of real danger involved in what they're doing that gets lost often when you use air, that's why I'm not a big fan of airsoft with muzzle flash replacement in VFX because the gun doesn't kick, it doesn't give the same bang. Firing blanks on set, yeah. the shot, and look, half the time you're indoors in a scene. The shock wave, when you I mean anyone that's gone to an indoor range, right, and shot live ammo, you feel each shot. Doosh, doosh, that pressure differential of, 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 the, the you know the shell gunpowder sucks something, out of, you. Suck something so, out of you yeah exactly and as an actor on set firing blanks everyone is responding to that whereas when someone's using airsoft stuff yeah. you can tell people are responding it's it's very nuanced but it makes a difference in the in the visceral um feeling um of guns you know yeah, no, no, absolutely. And yeah, definitely echoing, you know, everything that you're sharing. Um, I, I actually feel the same way kind of digressing back to Rocky. That's my favorite Rocky movie. 
uh, of, of all time, um, just on based on all the things that you've shared as well. And for me, it was the line where, you know, he sees Apollo Creed and Mickey's looking at him and he's saying, uh, Mickey's like, what's wrong? And then Rocky's like, I was, I was hoping he wouldn't show. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then he's saying, you know, that man is great. And in my eyes, I'm like, you're great. You just went toe to toe with him. You're just as equal as, as he is. And, you know, there's just a little bit of, uh, I guess, Rocky in, inside of all of us. But um, Joey, I want to, I want to thank you again. This has been a tremendous honor to have you on. I, I definitely want to steal you and do this again. Oh, um, any time. So, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, as soon as some of these uh, projects come out, you know, we can talk about some of them and uh, definitely, you know, share some more uh, of your knowledge around, you know, screenwriting. I'm, I'm definitely going to pick your brain a little bit and just, just want to thank you again for joining on and, and can't tell you how much of an honor it is to, to have you on today. Oh, thank you, man. It's been a blast, man. I love, this is, I love to talk about stuff I'm passionate about and movies and creating and, um, stuff is what i live for so anytime man pleasure's all mine i really appreciate it thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day cool man nice one see ya see ya, see ya. take care